All right, this morning we're going to Matthew 24, that great passage that uh, it causes you know, uh, Christians to have uh, disputes and disagreements uh, over. And so we will not cover this whole chapter in one day, but uh, we will, uh, through the course of many weeks, we will go through Matthew 24. And so the title this morning is, Do Not Be Deceived by False Christs. We're not going to go as far as I wanted to this morning, uh, but uh, we will uh, do what we can. Uh, it's a bit of an introduction as well, because uh, what we see in Matthew 24 uh, can be confusing, uh, and, and understandably. I want to read from verse 1 to verse uh, 14. Let's look at it together. And coming out from the temple, Jesus was going along, and his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Now as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things will, be, uh, will happen. Um, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. See uh, that you are not alarmed, for those things must take place. But that is not the end. <clears throat> Uh, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the, the beginning of birth pains. Uh, they, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and will deceive many. Because lawlessness is multiplied, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in the whole world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Let's go back to the first screen. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we come to you, and we definitely need your uh, wisdom, your guidance, your spirit to be our teacher. To be our guide, Lord, as we uh, plunge into language by our Lord that is uh, difficult to understand. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would guide us, that you would help us. Lord, we know that um, Christ is here speaking of future events. He's speaking of future events in his own day. Uh, but also, as we will see later on, uh, toward the end of Matthew, he's speaking of the end times when he will return. And now, Lord, we ask that for wisdom and understanding. And Lord, we're excited by these things, that Christ indeed uh, is returning. And we're excited that he's in absolute control. So Lord, now, Lord, we ask that you would bless. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to Matthew 24. And as I said earlier, it is a great portion of Scripture. And uh, I remember as a younger Christian, <clears throat> uh, actually before I was saved, I read a book by Tim LaHaye, the beginning of the end, which was a, a little book I picked up in Chelmsford when we, when we were living in Chelmsford about the end times. It's about the second coming of Christ. And I thought that was interesting because I was, uh, the Lord was opening my heart, my mind about these things. And uh, <clears throat> I read the book uh, prior to getting saved. And I was convinced of the return of Christ and of the uh, end of the world and of judgment that is to come. And uh, I have since changed my view. Uh, regarding uh, what Tim LaHaye and, uh, has uh, uh, been teaching or it continues to teach and others. But, but nevertheless, we rejoice in this, that Christ is returning. And uh, he is uh, going to bring judgment uh, upon the world at his return. And uh, we're thankful for these things. So we come to this portion of Scripture, which uh, 
uh, for some, uh, speaks uh, really of the end times. As they say, it's only about the end times, that's what they say. For others, they say it's speaking of the time period uh, or the generation shortly after the ascension of Jesus, where uh, others, like, like myself, uh, I see that there, there are elements of both. In other words, uh, the, the portion at the beginning, he talks about the immediate future, and afterwards he speaks of the end times. Uh, the events of the past three years have uh, certainly been challenging for all of us with the so-called pandemic, together with the many uh, oligarchs, that's a term that I uh, learned uh, last few years. What is an oligarch? Well, it's, uh, uh, these are multi-billionaires who have way too much money uh, for their own good and uh, have too, way too much time for their own good and who have evil hearts. Uh, now, money is not evil in itself. There are many people who are maybe not Christians, but they are, are wealthy and they use their money for good. But money will reveal what's in your heart. And so these uh, many men and many women, uh, I don't know who the women are, but they are those who have uh, way too much money and who are seeking to bring in a new world order. And that's not a conspiracy theory, that's a fact. If you dig deeper, you will realize that these things are there. And these have caused, these events of the past three years have caused a lot of Christians, a lot of, uh, a majority of biblical Christians to become more interested in the teachings of the last things. Uh, the end times of Christ's return and of the end of the world, also known as eschatology. Uh, so it reminds me of a passage in um, Romans 13, verse 11. Uh, so regarding all these things, the trials that we go through, you know, we may say, like Paul wrote in Romans 13, verse 11, for salvation is nearer for us now than when we first believed. Salvation is always nearer as the days progress forward. The salvation, the final consummation, the final day of our salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. <clears throat> now, I've come to understand that a good portion of Matthew 24 is really about the immediate events following the resurrection of Jesus, leading up to 70 AD, which is where the, we see the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple and of the many structures that are found there. And we do know that's part of history and that is factual. <clears throat> now, among the faithful, that is those who are born of the Spirit, there exists three main positions on the end times, uh, premillennial, and among the pre those who are, who are premillennial, there's the historic position, and there's also the dispensational position, um, and there's also the post-mill position, and there's also the all-mill position, which is really what I lean on. But I rejoice in all three of these uh, perspectives that they all believe in the gospel, they all believe in the return of Christ, they all believe in the uh, final resurrection, and uh, so I rejoice. And Christians can agree to disagree on these things, and... Uh, and still worship together, and still have fellowship together. And I, I firmly believe that. That's what we should be doing. So the big question, if you look at the sign of our, our, our church, it says, Jesus is returning. Are you ready? So the question here for you, for all of us, is are you ready? Because Jesus is returning. No doubt uh, our sign is viewed by a lot of people uh, in our community as they, um, <clears throat> I have some neighbors uh, and one neighbor across the road who really doesn't talk to me, but maybe he's seen the sign too many times, you know, uh, that Jesus is returning. Are you ready? It's a reminder that all of us need to get ready. How do we get ready? Well, we get ready by turning to Christ, by receiving the free offer of salvation that is uh, through the cross. So we are ready when we get right with God, when we're born again of the Spirit of God. And so are you ready here this morning? Are you ready because Christ is returning? It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing to know that Christ is returning. And so you need to be ready. I need to be ready. If you're in Christ, you're already ready. But if you're not in Christ, if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, and then you'll be right with Him, and you'll be ready for when Christ returns. That will be the end, and there will be judgment. Christ could return tomorrow. We don't know. He will return at a time where it is unexpected. And so we need to understand that Jesus is returning, and it's not a game, and that's not a conspiracy theory. It is based on fact. It's not theory. It's truth. 
It is the truth of the word of God says that Christ is returning and will bring an end to all things. Where there will be judgment, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. <clears throat> and so, as we look at Matthew 23, I'll do a brief review of some of the verses there. We know that Jesus was preaching uh, that um, Israel was a covenant breaker. Israel was guilty of breaking the covenant with God, and that Christ was bringing a covenant lawsuit against his own people. We see that in the Old Testament as well. In the Isaiah, the, uh, Isaiah was crying out to Israel and saying, you are breaking the covenant of God, and I'm bringing before you a covenant lawsuit. And so we, Christ was doing the same thing. Look at verse uh, 23, Matthew 23, verse 23, or 33 and following. And Christ says to the scribes and Pharisees, You serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore I send you prophets and wise men and scribes. He's speaking of after his ascension. He's going to send uh, preachers and leaders of the church, wise men and scribes, not in the same sense as scribes as the as, uh, as, as whom he was uh, condemning. He says, some of you, some of whom you will kill and crucify. The history of the church is filled with believers, those who were followers of Christ and were killed. And Christ is saying this to the Jews here. And some of you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. Paul was doing that, going from house to house, arresting. That is Paul before he was converted. So that you may come all... Uh, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation, he says. He makes it very clear. On this generation, he's speaking condemnation to the people of Israel because we know, and Jesus know, knows, and he knew that they were going to reject him and so after his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, this is what will happen. And so they will persecute the church, persecute the new believers. And Christ uh, says finally, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Final verse 38. See, your house is left to you desolate. Your house is left to you desolate. And now with all this, we come to Matthew 24. Look at verse 1, 2, and 3. And coming out from the temple. So a bit of time went by after these last words in Matthew 23. Coming out from the temple, Jesus was going uh, along, and his disciples came to point out the temple buildings to him. I thought for many years that Oh, they were just looking, you know, just going, uh, going, going along, la di da, and just the disciples. Oh, look at these beautiful buildings! <laughs> I thought that's what they were for the longest time. I thought that's what they were doing. But no, they were pointing out these things in light of what Christ had said in verse thirty-eight, where Christ says, "See, your house is left to you desolate." So they heard, they were hearing the words of Jesus that Christ was speaking condemnation upon Israel and upon the nation of Israel at that time. And so um, here, Jesus, the disciples said, well, then, in light of that, look at these buildings. Look at these uh, beautiful structures here. And he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another which will not be torn down. He's speaking specifically of 70 A.D., where we know, here, um, you know, it's really a fascinating history, where we see um, Titus, the, uh, the Roman, not governor, but governing the uh, Roman general. 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 Yeah, general. Yeah, so he was the one who basically, after the uprise, uh, the, 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 re the re rebellion among the many Jews, they had no choice. They basically had to destroy everything. And so, here with these words, uh, not one stone will be left upon another. It's not like, you know, if you go there today in, in Israel, you'll see some stones still put together. But it's a figure of speech to say, it'll be utterly destroyed. There'll be nothing left for you to use. 
And so Christ is speaking, those words here are very significant as we proceed here into Matthew 24. Now, verse 3, now as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, and so now, now Christ is on the Mount of Olives, and this whole discourse in Matthew 24 is known as the Olivet Discourse. <clears throat> the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, three questions here, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So first of all, when will these things happen? When? So remember at this point in time, the disciples were not, were not aware that Jesus was going to die on the cross, which was like a few days away. They were not aware of this, and it was not on their ra radar at that time. So they really anticipated his rule and reign as Messiah now. They're thinking that, oh, he's going to establish his kingdom now. Uh, and they were still uh, had the mindset that he was going to be on a horse somehow, or he's going to conquer the Romans and reestablish the nation of Israel. They really didn't fully understand. So they were thinking, like, when? In a few weeks from now? Or a few months down the road. Therefore, uh, Christ uh, would bring about many things very soon, we know, namely judgment, but not an earthly rule like his, his disciples thought. So again, they were thinking immediately, an earthly kingdom. So when will these things happen? The other question is, what will be the sign of your coming? What will be the marker point pointing to your arrival? What would be the sign, the marker um, uh, or when will you come to rule as Messiah? A short time down the road, possibly? When will you come to do these things? And the other question is, when will be the end of the age? Now with these words of Christ, that not one stone will be left upon another, that, that is the sign or the indicator that this will be a major event in the history of Israel. Major. Because we know that the temple of, uh, at that time, was the temple of Herod. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful structure. It was destroyed. The temple was destroyed before, many centuries later, before. And now it was rebuilt. And now Christ is saying, this structure will be destroyed. <clears throat> and which will bring about the end of the known age of covenantal Israel. So again, verse 3. Let me read that. Now as he, was sitting, uh, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming or of the end of the age. The end of the age. Basically the known age. The, no, the, the end of covenantal Israel is coming. And Christ is pointing that out. Now the disciples were thinking of the immediate future. And Christ responds by giving them signs of the immediate future from approximately verse 4 to, till verse 35, and uh, which we'll look into, but uh, of course we can't cover everything this morning. I found a quote on the online, and I, I thought that was really good. Uh, he, this author says, Isaiah, or Isaiah chapter 1, can be regarded as a covenantal lawsuit against Israel, and rightly so. And it reflects Deuteronomy 32 which also condemned Israel for its rejection of God. Isaiah wrote about the great calamities and ultimate restoration of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant of Moses, declared would occur. And he says that regarding Isaiah and Deuteronomy, that it begins with the near future, but includes the far future. And I thought that's very interesting because this is what our Lord is doing here. He's speaking about the near future, but he's also speaking about the far future here in Matthew 24. Because we know at one point in Matthew 24, he's definitely speaking about the end times. It cannot be applied for, uh, for the immediate future, that is, in the first century. And uh, so we see Christ teaching in that way. So looking at verse 1 to verse 3 again. And coming out from the temple, Jesus was going along, and his disciples came to, up to this uh, to point out the temple buildings to him. Again, in the context of how uh, uh, he will leave these things desolate. <clears throat> and he answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? I Surely I say to you, not one stone will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Verse 3, 
now as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and saying, tell us when will these things happen and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. Let's look at verse 4. Verse 4. So I said uh, years ago, I preached uh, through Matthew 24 and 25 uh, on the second coming of Christ. And, uh, and I did say back then, and I, I will say again today, that uh, I said back five years ago, six years ago, that um, it may be that uh, when I study this text again, I may come to some different conclusions. I may change my view, my opinion. And uh, so whatever I preached five, six years ago, I don't have the notes. <laughs> the sermon is on, uh, is on the computer here. It's not online. So I'm not sure exactly what I said, but now here it's a totally different sermon. And I think that um, I think I have a deeper conviction regarding what we see in Matthew 24, that especially at the beginning, Christ is indeed speaking in reference to the destruction of uh, the temple. And so that all the trials that would, that would, that would occur uh, for the, that generation leading up to the, uh, the destruction of the temple and of the many structures in Jerusalem. Verse 4, <clears throat> Christ continues. He says here, And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one deceives you. That no one deceives you. Now, I believe that, first of all, Christ is saying this to his disciples, first of all. It applies to them first. So here's the question. Is it even possible for, that his disciples could be deceived in any way? Is it possible? You know, is it like uh, now that they're apostles, they're like infallible. They can just discern all things. They can never be deceived. Well, of course, the apostles can be deceived. And we see a few examples of that where they were kind of like didn't see what was going on at the very beginning. And we'll look at this uh, very shortly here. So, of course, that is why he is teaching them these things that they, because if they were not informed, they could be led astray by certain deceivers. There was much going on, we know, at that time. Ever since they began following Christ, and of course, they could not uh, take in everything that he taught them, and nor would they be able to process what was coming next. Christ's betrayal. That was unexpected. His arrest. The mockery of justice. The false accusations, the physical torture, he was flogged, the crown of thorns was placed on his head, his sentencing, his death, and then his burial. These are things that they, they did not expect. They were completely blindsided because they really believed that Christ was going to be the leader to cast out the Roman Empire and restore Israel and, and so on and so forth. And it's exactly what is seen in the Old Testament on many occasions where there were physical battles and a physical restoration. And then after Christ's resurrection, with the day of Pentecost, with the fullness of the Spirit upon, upon them, they were finally putting, uh, putting it together. And finally, they began to understand, and they were, what, preaching with boldness, with power, with authority. With Christ's return to heaven, the real test was upon them, where they will be stretched and pulled in every direction. They will be tested. So that's why Christ says to them, see to it that no one deceives you. See to it that no one deceives you, he's saying. People will attempt to lead you astray in any way they can, together with the flock under your care. Watch over them. Don't be deceived. And please, watch over them, uh, the, 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 those who are under your care, watch over them that they are not deceived. Uh, here are a few examples of how the early church and the apostles were deceived at first, at the beginning. Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, they were professing believers, no doubt would have been baptized. They were part of the church. And there was a situation where people, were, they were not forced to sell anything they had, but they had not an opportunity to sell. So they sold, and they said, oh, we sold uh, the property for this much, when in fact it was much higher than what they sold. And so they lied to the apostles and to the church. And so at the beginning, they, were, they would have seen them as just as other believers and were not... Uh, they were kind of like led, led along to believe that they were Christians. Uh, what about uh, Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8? He was baptized, right? He was baptized. And so, so they were <laughs> uh, deceived in that sense. So the question here for us is how uh, can these words apply to us as well? Is it possible for any of us to be deceived? 
Absolutely. We know it's true. That all believers can be deceived. And we, we, because none of us know truth in absolute terms. None of us know everything in absolute terms. So we're all growing. And so we're all, we need to develop our ability to be discerning. John MacArthur, uh, one of his sermons he preached many years ago. And I remember what he, this, what he said. He said, the greatest danger facing the church today is its lack of discernment. And I completely agree. The greatest danger facing the church today is its lack of discernment. I mean, look at all the churches that are out there, especially those that are on TV and who are false teachers. They're leading people astray. Especially the church, especially in, its, in prosperous West, is looking or greatly, lack, greatly lacking in wisdom and discernment. It is. Which is why we see in Scripture, in Ephesians 4, 11 and 14, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. So God is the one who has called men to be leaders of the church. First of all, starting with the apostles, where they were given supernatural uh, gifts and uh, even uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach uh, what the Spirit would tell them. And there were prophets, those who would preach the Word of God effectively. Then the evangelists and shepherds and teachers. These are the pastors of the churches. Verse 14 says, says here, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried up, um, about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Like deceitful schemes. So when believers are grounded in the Word of God, we're not tossed about in every direction. We know what the truth is. We are founded upon Scripture alone. So for us, the words of Christ here, see to it that no one deceives you. There's an application for us as well here. First of all, it applies to the early apostles, the early disciples, but also applies to us. We as believers need to be immersed in the Word of God, to know the Word of God, to study it on a daily basis, to read it, to come together, to study it together, and to have the conviction of sola scriptura, which is what? Scripture alone. Scripture alone. I'm not going to go anywhere else. Scripture alone is what will guide and lead the believer. So regarding the days of the, uh, in the first century leading up to, the, to 70 AD, those days we know are behind us. They're behind us. May we learn from them, and we will as we continue here in Matthew 24, as, even as we do a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of this portion of Scripture. But now for us, as we anticipate the return of Christ, let us see uh, to it that no one deceives us regarding the end times or the last days and Christ's glorious return. And there are many views, many perspectives, and I, I praise the Lord, I, I thank the Lord that there are many, uh, these, these three main positions, they all preach the gospel, they preach Christ, they preach Him crucified and that He's risen from the dead, and they preach that Christ is returning, and I rejoice in those things. So may the Lord help us as we continue. I'm not done here this morning. <laughs> may the Lord help us as we continue to study these things that Christians can agree to disagree, and let's, let's continue to have fellowship together. And so let's continue. Verse 5. This uh, mic thing keeps keep sliding. <clears throat> Verse 5. Jesus continues, and he says, looking at verse 3 again, he says, See to it that no one deceives you. And he says, verse 5, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Now, when Christ had come, during the days of his flesh, that's an expression in scriptures, it means it speaks of his incarnation, no one else on earth left a mark like he did. No one even came close. The impact crater that Christ uh, made still has a powerful, powerful ripple effect around the world. So, no one made an impact like he did. And with Christ's departure, which was not public, so it seems to me, in Acts chapter 1, Christ ascended up to heaven. He, I think it seems there he was with his disciples, and only a few actually witnessed his departure. Thus, not all of the believers would have known immediately that he had left. 
And there would, been a, there would have been a great longing for, for Christ in the hearts of all who loved him. Especially after his death, a lot of believers, they would have just been, like, confused. They would have left, maybe went, went away, and, oh, it's, it's, all, it's over and done with. You know, uh, their hopes are, are dashed. But the uh, Christ did not appear to everyone, right, after his resurrection. He appeared here and there. And uh, after his ascension, not all knew that he had ascended up to heaven. So a lot of the believers at that time, they would have uh, this great longing to, to know Christ or to see him again. And so, especially for the weaker believers at that time, they, would have, they could have easily been deceived hearing rumors that Christ was here or that he was there. So Christ says, for many will come in my name. What does that mean? Well, I think it's a simple reference to those who claim to be Jesus' representatives. In other words, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a teacher of the church. Follow me. And there would have been many at that time. One example of that is like decades after the resurrection of Jesus are the Judaizers of Galatia. Right? These were those who claimed to be representatives and they were teaching a false gospel to the church of Galatia. And when we think of the incredible number of those today who claim to be followers of Christ when in reality they're not, well, if it's true today, it was also true in the early church, even with the apostles. So, so there would have been those, definitely in the days of the uh, apostles, that there would have been those who were teaching falsehood and who were not teaching the truth and who were claiming to be representatives of Christ when in fact they were not. <clears throat> Furthermore, verse 5 says, again, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. There's a quote from uh, Don Carson. He says, Many claim to be Messiah, or Christ himself. They come in his name as if they were he himself. Would be deliverers. So these people who claim to be messiahs in the days after Christ, they basically they're saying that they are deliverers. They are they will rescue them. Have a, so would be deliverers have appeared in every age, not least the first century. We do see many evidences of that. Um, here's a few that I found uh, in uh, Acts chapter five, thirty four. Uh, it says the following. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the man outside for a little while. So here were, were a few of the, the apostles and who were basically being, <laughs> they were under arrest. And Gamaliel said to them, Men of Israel, take care that you, are, uh, that you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. And after him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So there were those, um, these, exactly the timeline of these men, uh, I'm not sure, but maybe before Christ or during the days of Christ, or, uh, uh, but these men, they were like, Messiahs. They were kind of those who said, we'll deliver you from the bondage of, of Rome and so forth. And also we look at the words of Christ, even here in Matthew 24, a bit further down, verse 23 and following, Jesus says, along the same line, he says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets then there's those who are preaching, will arise, he says, and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. <clears throat> Here's a quote from a commentator, R.T. France. He says the following, the first false alarm is in the form of messianic Claimants, that is, those who make claims to be Messiah. The Christian reader, prompted by the specific mention of the coming of Christ, might think that those who will come in Jesus' name claiming to be Messiah are claiming 
actually to be Jesus returning at the end of the age. But the declaration of I am the Messiah would not be the most natural way to make the claim. It sounds more like a would-be liberator presenting himself to the Jewish people for the first time. He would be coming in Jesus' name, not because he is impersonating Jesus, but because he is claiming the role and title which properly belong to Jesus. So we do see that. Those who are making the claim of uh, having the role and title of Jesus. And there were plenty of such claimants, those who made that claim, in the unsettled years leading up to the Jewish revolt and the eventual destruction of the temple. See, for instance, Josephus. Josephus, a great deal to say about these things, about uh, the history of Israel, uh, even after the... Uh, the uh, death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, he mentions uh, Thudas, it's, just, it's, a, it's a different Thudas, and he says, furthermore, Josephus does not say any of these people actually claim to be title, to the title of Messiah, but that some presented themselves as prophets or kings. And he gives all kinds of examples here in Josephus and claimed to be divinely sent and empowered, with, which suggests messianic aspirations. So look at verse 5 again. For many, many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. What did Christ, Christ say? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by, through me. So, so many will come, even in the days following uh, Jesus, and even since then, even today, there are those who claim to be the way, the truth, and the life. Don't listen to them. Don't believe them. Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. Thus, we see Christ's warnings were true in the uh, years after his return to heaven. And by extension to us, we know that these false messiahs, these false Christs, and false prophets and preachers have been around these past 2,000 years. I love church history, and I love history. Uh, it's really astonishing, if you look at it. Uh, the history of the church is a history of also all, sight, all sorts and all kinds of heresies, false teachers, false preachers, uh, those who are claiming to be uh, followers of Christ. Look at the 1800s. It's a real mishmash. It was like anything goes, and the Mormons came out of that. And we think of the Jehovah's Witnesses. At the, I don't know, I think it's at the beginning of the 19th century. We see so much confusion in our day uh, as well regarding what is true Christianity. And so, again, by extension to us, we know that these false messiahs and prophets have been around for the past 2,000 years. So let us heed these words of Christ for generations to come. We need to take heed to these words. Jesus says again, verse 4, See to it that no one deceives you. See to it that no one deceives you. Ever since I was a young Christian, I made a commitment. I'm going to, to stick to the Word of God alone and nothing else. I'm going to look into the Word of God. I'm going to dig deeper and deeper and deeper because I want to know what the truth is. And every Christian should have that conviction. Let us affirm the Reformation conviction of sola scriptura. The Word of God, of God alone is our guide for faith and practice. For in holding to this, we will not be led astray by every wind of doctrine. Next week, we will look at verses 6 and, six and following. Uh, there's a whole lot more that we can look at. But I just want to conclude here this morning. There is only one Messiah. There's only one Jesus Christ. There's only one. And there's only one eternal Christ who put on human flesh. There's only one. Where he was truly God and truly man which disqualifies all human beings, disqualifies myself. And this God-man went to the cross 2,000 years ago and took upon himself our sins and received upon himself our punishment. He was punished in my place. If I was not a Christian, if I would have died, I would have stood before God and I would have been punished for my sins. I would have been sent to hell. I would have been cast to hell. But Christ took upon himself my sins. And so he was punished 
And so I am not going to be punished. I will not be punished. I know I'm going to heaven because of what Christ has done. Mm -hmm. The sin bearer, also Jesus, he had to be sinless. This again disqualifies all of us, all of humanity. We're all disqualified. We saw this morning in Sunday school that Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. No exception. Even Elijah, who was taken up to heaven in bodily form, he was still alive. Even Enoch, they were still sinners. They were also sinners. Hebrews 4.15 4, uh, says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is in, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ is the only one who is sinless. So therefore we are to look at the Lord Jesus Christ and his uniqueness, which is what is brought out in John 3.16. What does it say? It says here, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And that basically means, speaks of his uniqueness. The French translation has the word unique in there, and which, which is a correct translation. So his only son speaks of the uniqueness of Christ. There's no one else like him. No one even comes close that whoever believes or places his trust in him should not perish but have eternal life. In our world, there are many deceivers. There are many false religions. When I was a teenager, I was led astray by all kinds of funny stuff. Okay, <laughs> put it that way. And at one point, I just got tired. What is the truth? What is, the, what, is the, what is true reality? And I didn't know what it was. And then the Lord led me to open my understanding about who he was, little by little. And I thought, there is one God, there is one Christ. Who is he? I want to know him. And I made a commitment that I was going to, to uh, overturn every stone until I found out what the truth was. And that mindset I kept as a Christian. I'm not going to be satisfied with just Oh, that's good enough for me. No, I won't. I'm not satisfied until I overturn every stone, even as a believer. And so there are many false religions in the world, many false messiahs uh, in, in these many religions, and many false expressions of Christianity, but there's only one Christ. There's only one Christ, and we are to look to Him. So this morning, place your trust in Him. Again, Jesus is returning. Are you ready? Are you ready? Turn to Him. Repent. Give your life over to Christ. And he will save you to the uttermost. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the teachings of Christ. And Lord, we're faced with many challenges. As we continue in Matthew 24 and many other portions of Scripture, when we see the words of Christ, and Lord, they are indeed a challenge for us. And we seek to understand the truth. For we seek to understand who is the way, the truth, and the life. We seek to understand what Christ is actually teaching. We're thankful that... Christ is indeed returning, and uh, Lord, we do, do find these teachings, these wonderful teachings in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, 25, and we thank you for the, those teachings. But we also know, Lord, that, uh, that uh, Christ was also teaching and making a reference to the immediate future, the near future of his day, where uh, God was bringing uh, judgment upon unfaithful Israel. Uh, it was a covenant lawsuit and uh, where God finally brought judgment upon his own people, which he did on many occasions back in the Old Testament, but now he was doing the same thing. So now, Lord, we ask for wisdom. Help us to understand these things as we proceed through the Gospel of Matthew. And, Lord, open the eyes and the understanding of all those, Lord, who may not know Christ, even anyone here, that they may come to know the Lord Jesus and enjoy him forever. Bless, Lord, we thank you. Bless each one in Jesus' name.